Okay, welcome back to Barry T's Garage. Today we actually are enco encountering some problems, uh, getting some of these things running properly or getting them running at all. And uh, I thought it would be valuable to bring you along to understand some of the parts of the classic car hobby that are real. It's part of owning older cars and keeping them running, keeping them operating. So to start this car, I'm gonna get over here. It's in neutral now. This, this car's got a four-speed transmission, and it's gated like a Rolls-Royce. Um, you've got reverse here, first, neutral, second, third, neutral, fourth. And that's your emergency brake. This is a dry-sumped car, so when I turn the ignition switch to the on position, um, I have unshorted the magneto. Okay. And I've turned on the oil. And then once we start the car up, we have no oil at all in the dry sump tank. The dry sump tank is right here um, in front of the dash. So right now there's no oil in the dry sump tank. So right now all the oil, which is maybe two quarts, is in the pan of the engine. And it's not going to circulate yet because it doesn't circulate from the pan. The pan of the engine is below the bottom dippers on the crankshaft. You know, okay. it, it's an extended pan. It's a dry sumped race car. Okay. So the only oil that the engine sees is the oil that comes from the pan back through the pump into the dry sump tank and then is fed back into the main bearings and fed into the troughs that the dippers on the rods pull from. Okay, so it does have an oil pump. It does have an oil pump. Okay. But, but when you start this engine dry, there's no oil that's circulating in the engine. Okay. Because the oil that's in the pan now, which is too much, mm -hmm. is below where the dippers are, okay. and the pump doesn't pump directly from the, from the engine or from the pan to the main bearings. Okay. It pumps to fill up the dry sump oil, which is on the, the dash part. Okay. So is it not pressurized? Or is it a pressurized oil It's system? pressurized with gravity. <laughs> okay. So it's got a pressure pump, but the pressure pump is putting it into the dry sumped pan. Okay. Tank. This is the dry sump tank for oil, uh -huh. and that's the spirit or the fuel. Right. So this half here, which is, it isn't half, it's just a couple quarts of the oil sits here. And they did this, so there's, this is a, this is a Voiturette race car. A four-speed Voiturette race car. This was a a, a commoner's car. You could just be a normal rich fellow and have this. This was not a factory race car. Okay. So this was something they made 10 of or 20 of and sold it to you for one fourth as much as a factory race car would be. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a formula car, i.e. it's either two liter or three liter or 1.5 liter. This one's a two liter car. But to make everything as efficient as possible, they didn't want to have just a, a normal oil bath like the engines were of the day. So the engines of the day were the pan, um, whatever was in the pan, the bottom of the crankshaft would hit, the dippers would run in that oil and splash it all over the engine. Right. The problem is on those engines or those cars, if you were doing a hill climb and you had your pan full enough that, you could, that the dippers would, would play in that oil, if you were going up a steep hill, you'd have a huge amount of oil that the back of the crankshaft was hitting. Right. And you'd have a tremendous amount of splash, didn't have any windage trays or anything to keep it out of the, out of the combustion chamber or the bottom, of, where, bottom where the piston was right. going up and down the cylinder. So you would just make a big mess. So on the race cars, they, they tried to make it more efficient by not having the friction of continually churning in the oil. Okay. But Very the good. negative on that is when you start this, you're starting it dry because it has no oil in the parts of it, the engine that it needs. Okay, so is there a way to overcome that? Not really, but I'll show you what you're gonna see here when we start to start it. Okay. So when I, when I turn the, this switch over from off to on, uh -huh. it unshorts the magneto. Right. So that means the ignition source would work, and it also opens the valve for the, for the dry sump, okay. for the oil. Now, if this had just been parked for a week or less, we would see oil inside of this, this glass tube. But we see no oil in there because 
The last time I drove this car was before COVID. So it's been four or five years now, which is bad for an old car to, to let it sit. Mm -hmm. But I know that all of that oil that was in the dry sump has now evacuated the dry sump and then slowly trickled into the pan. So the pan's got too much in it right now. So when I flip this over, we're still not gonna have any oil in this. Okay. Once we start it, um, we're gonna let it idle very slowly. The oil will start coming up on the bottom of this until it gets to about halfway or three quarters of the way. And then once it gets up to about a quarter of the way, then it starts feeding all the lines that go into the engine. Okay. which is where the main bearings are. So it only feeds the three main bearings. That's all it really feeds. Okay. And it feeds the troughs for each of the four rods for the dippers on the, on the rods. So right now the troughs still have oil in it because you, the, the trough that has no hole, hole in it. Okay. Um, so it has nowhere to go. It's just going to still be well, there. It's, it's still going to be there. So it's not going to be really a dry start, but mm -hmm. we're not going to have fresh oil for the mains, but there's still going to be an oily main because it, you, it doesn't clean itself. It's still got something in there. Right. But that's what we're going to see. So when we turn that over, now it would start. On the, the accessories on the car, before we do that, this is a Voiturette race car. So this is a lap timer. So the, the Voiturette race cars would go race closed courses. And the closed course wasn't like the Indy 500 track, but the closed course was maybe a mixture of four or five small little villages it would go 10 laps of those four or five villages. And this is what the mechanician would hit each time to each time a lap to count the laps because you needed oh, okay. to go 10 laps or 20 laps, whatever you needed yeah, to go. It did change. So right now it's on 28 laps if that one is done. Right. right. So you would keep doing that. And they would, the scorekeepers for the towns would also log you in, but the mechanician would let the driver know how many laps that they did. This is, it was a pretty prominent thing back then for smoking. So this is a cigarette dispenser. This is your cigarettes. And that's where you put your cigarettes in. Hmm. This is your pens and your, your pencils your holder on the side. That's a trophy that it won in the 20s. And that trophy is, uh, we use it for a pencil box or a toolbox, yeah. but it's, it's sterling silver and this is sterling silver too. Those are some of the awards and some of the, the medallions that this earned and, and was born with. Mm -hmm. This is a motor Android, which is so you can adjust your carburetor. So this tells you what your altitude is in your bar barometric pressure. So we're at 2,100 feet elevation, mm -hmm. and that's actually what it's showing. Yep. Uh, and why do uh, three quarters of the early race cars have that? So you can adjust your jets on your car. A lot of them have adjustable jets. And you'll also know what your performance is at 2,000 compared to 3,000 or 4,000 feet. Okay. You know what your performance is. And lots of times, if you're at 4,000 feet elevation, if you can't adjust your carburetor, you would know to advance your timing more, more than not. You know, if you had a 50s car on Route 66 mm -hmm. and you took it to a station to have them rejet it for the high altitude when you covered the northern part of Arizona, they weren't adjusting your carburetor. They were giving you another three or four points on your, on your timing for your oh, advance. Okay. Okay. But on the old cars, they have, some of them have adjustables that Bugatti does adjustable carburetors and adjustable timing. So you know you have to give it less fuel and more timing at altitude. Okay, so this is not using GPS. How does it know your altitude? By barometric pressure. Barometric it's the same pressure. thing that the airplanes used in 1910 to 1920. When an airplane is flying at 6,000 feet elevation, it doesn't care what the actual elevation is is what, what is the apparent elevation based on the barometric pressure. Nice. That's how you adjust your richness and your leanness. Same thing on the old racing cars. Okay. So the motor androids are common. Okay. I would say half the vehicles in there have that. Okay, and it's really exactly for the carburetor. The carburetor is looking at the same thing. It's how much air is, how much oxygen's in the air, yep. right? So the carburetor's wanting to know that to run right. That's right. And, that's, and it's just giving you a reference to help you with that. Okay. Yeah. That's very cool. So you're going to know as a racer that you, your, your climbing ability at 4,500 feet is going to be 25% less than what it is at 1,500 feet. So you're going to stay in a lower gear. You're going you're gonna to change your habit on that race based on that altitude. You know, once you realize all of the instrumentation that it has and all the rest of them in there, especially on the... The elaborate ones like the, the Vitesse, the Bugatti, this one, mm -hmm. and the Renault. Incredible gauges that tells you real information. Right. And, and it's fun real... information. You really know it. 
It's right. not an idiot light. It's a gauge. It tells you how much more or how much less this is. Right. What your fuel pressure is. Yeah. You know, what it is. This is your tilt meter. So for hill climbing, that shows you the angle of your tilt because this would also be used in hill climbs. And then in hill climbs, it would be really important. You would know that for a zero to 5% grade, you could climb it in fourth gear, say. Okay. If you had a 7% grade, you could never do it more than third gear. Okay. And if it's a 12% grade, you couldn't go it, you couldn't be in any gear higher than second gear. And if it's a 20% grade, you gotta be in first. So instead of you not knowing Instead of you not knowing when you started racing, you messed around trying to shift it. And these weren't easy cars to shift. You mm -hmm. would know this steepness of a hill, I'm going to stay in second gear or first gear or third gear mm -hmm. and not mess around with trying to shift to get more speed because you know you can't do it. On the, the, the cowl, well, this is the speedometer. It goes to 90 mile an hour. This is only about a 65 mile an hour race car. This is the TAC. Uh, the TAC goes to 3000 RPM. Wow. Um, it'll spin 2,500 RPM. It's similar to our Bugatti on that. Uh, this is uh, a Voiturat race car, would also be considered a gentleman's sports car. This was the, like the Corvette of the day. So, so a Corvette isn't a factory race car. It's a really nice sports car. It's, you right. know, it's, it's more sleek and more beautiful and it's, it's kind of more beautiful because it's not really very practical. You know, two passenger, you can't go to Home Depot type thing. Right. This was kind of the same, this fit the same genre same idea. back in 1909. Mm -hmm. So this was not a factory race car with a giant motor, mm -hmm. but this was far more and far fancier than what a touring car would have been at the dating hall, your whole family in. Sure. Would it the, also be more fun to drive? This, this would be a lot more fun to look at for sure, because this is racy as it could be. Right. It, it's got to be more fun to drive because you can take corners faster than what you could your touring car. Yep. And then the touring car is going to have wood wheels and they're not demountables. These are demountable wire wheels, so you can change the tire in a matter of a few seconds. Mm -hmm. So this was a very, this would be a very sleek, uh, exciting car to have. You know, in, it's a European car, so this is 1909. Mm -hmm. If this was America, um, and this car was around, it was around kind of in 1913 and 14. It was called a Mercer Raceabout. It was called a Stutz Bearcat from American manufacturers. Right. Kind of the same thing. Okay. You know, a two passenger rake steering, you know, mm -hmm. instead of a steering straight up and down, you know, a long rake, yep. two passenger only. So this would be, this is the same silhouette as the Stutzes were and the Mercers were. And right. the Stutzes and Mercers weren't really race cars either, but they were the early European sports car of the day. And the roads that they had in Europe, at least they had roads, were somewhat narrow, still windy. There weren't freeways of any kind. So when you were traveling with this at its normal cruise speed of 45 or 50 mile an hour, this was lightning fast and, and really controllable nicely. Mm -hmm. uh, so it would be a really nice, nice vehicle to have. This vehicle, Delage made as many of the Concordia Elegance winners as Bugatti did in the 30s and the 40s. But Delage made race cars first and then they made luxury cars. So this is in the era when they made the race cars. Delage also made airplane engines and this is one of the airplane engines that Delage made in 1909 where the cylinders spun. So this radiator ornament is real, is old, the same age as the car, and that's what their, their engines that they made actually did in 1909. That's wild. And then I live in Arizona and as long as I'm going over 24 mile an hour, no matter how hot it is in the daytime, I have fresh, cool air blowing on me. <laughs> you know, it's a crank start car, yep. uh, but also I've added a starter to it in case I ever got old. Okay. Um, it's unlikely, but it could <laughs> yeah. happen. There's a couple more things of note. Yeah. Okay, we're going to shine on the, on the, the Magneto. The okay. Magneto is a racing Magneto. Okay, Alan, let's talk about specifically, let's just do a little cutaway story about timing and the, the electronics involved here with this Magneto on this car. A hundred years ago, 110 years ago, you retarded the timing on a Magneto and you could do that. Um, and then when you started, you would advance it. But the problem is on racing cars back in the day and cars that you may have raised the compression today on that are hundred years old, you can't really change the timing on a Magneto. Why? Because the Magneto has a, has a curve. And in, maybe you can advance the Magneto on paper 
25 or 30 degrees. But it's only going to give you maximum sparks somewhere in that span of 25 or 30 degrees. Okay. You know, it really peaks somewhere. So if you, ray, if you have raised the compression, it's not going to give you full spark. It might not give you any spark at some end or another of your, of your range. If you raise the compression outside of the range that a magneto can fire, a magneto, an antique ma magneto, okay. may not fire at all. You know, it'll fire in free space, in free air. Okay. But as soon as you put compression on top by the cylinder, and by raising the compression a little bit more because of your uh, flat top pistons that you increase the dome on or you've okay. done something with, uh -huh. you might not have any fire. Okay. So by using a, an old magneto in an old racing situation or an old magneto in a new racing situation with an old car, their range is very, very limited. So even though you know because you've spun it on your lathe that, that it has spark all the way through, it may not spark and start your engine. So that's a good thing to know. What manufacturers did, or at least one manufacturer did, they made a racing magneto back in 1908, 1909, that they used through another five or six years more after that. Okay. And the brand that did, that developed this magneto type is a MIA, M-E-A. Okay. And this MIA magneto, you don't advance the timing. It has fixed timing, and it has fixed timing exactly on the, the, the high point of where the, the magneto has the most spark when, it, when the points break. So no matter what your compression is, but you, it's not fixed. It, it's, I mean, it's, it's fixed on a position to that point. Okay. So if you need to retard it so it doesn't kick you, uh, it, it'll kick you. So what they've done is Mia made a housing. So as you would sit in the car, okay. you, would, you would touch your, your vary your timing Mm -hmm. And you'd vary your timing so the entire magneto housing would move. I see. So it would also go 25 or 30 degrees like a normal magneto, but that magneto would be at the very peak of its performance no matter where you had it set. So if you wanted to crank start a car and then you had an old style magneto and you're off the curve of the magneto, you might have to hand crank it at three or four hundred rpm on your crank hand crank speed because where you've retarded it you don't have very much of a spark there so you need to spin that magneto fast because you still have the same compression what a mia would allow you to do is retard it fully to whatever point you want to start it you'll have maximum spark you can pull through on your hand crank okay. and get maximum spark at the lowest rpm and it'll start very quickly and as well as when you advance it to your normal run position, you have maximum spark. And the other thing you have, uh, on, the, on the formula cars back 110 years ago, you, this has a four speed and has, the formula cars have smaller engines. So you're gonna be able to utilize your magneto when you're lugging your, your car, you're going up a steep hill in a race, uh, maybe instead of downshifting, which might take you a lot of time, you might be able to retard your timing to get more performance and in a race car that has a Mia Magneto, by retarding your timing, you still have maximum spark at that point, but you're timing the engine exactly what, of where it wants to be at that RPM, and you haven't had to shift, and you're, you're on your way. Gotcha. So it's a really incredible thing they decided to make on just a simple thing of a Magneto by making it perfect. A, a modern distributor advances centrifugally, mm -hmm you know, or electronically on the real modern cars. So right. you have optimum spark every, on all, your entire RPM range. Yeah. Back 110 years ago, you had, you had spark at one point throughout the whole range of your, so you didn't have any performance below that and above that really, right. because you needed, the, the mag needed to follow that. Right. But you can, by moving it at that control, you can follow it. So if right. you're in third gear or fourth gear, or you're lugging it in a low gear, you can just pull it back and you have maximum spark no matter how much you've raised your compression. Excellent. So that's a racing magneto, extremely rare. Mm -hmm. You won't find them on anything besides racing cars. Wow. So uh, how often do you run across one of those being available? I haven't seen any. <laughs> I mean, it's super, super rare. Okay. But if you ever found one, uh, it, it makes a, it brings to life a, a two or three liter racing engine from back then because you have one more option for you. What kind of races during what time were those in use? These uh, that would be the closed course races. And the closed course race was, 
you know, between five or six cities. So you'd have the normal hills that you would encounter mm -hmm. on, uh, by going through towns, by going, uh, it wouldn't be a flat racetrack, an oval, of course, it'd be a road course. Right. So there'd be hills in it. Where there's a reason to change. There's, because you have corners, you have, you have hills, you have all kinds of things where you're gonna go through your range of your engine and your transmission. Well, now you have one more option to not shift as often. Okay, very good. Well, thanks for bringing all that detail. This is, this is really great history. So this is the Voiturette race car, and the races weren't races like we know them today where you had 30 or 40 cars on the starting line, you raced on a loop and lap. You had all different kinds of special tests like a Gymkhana. Yeah. So for example, one test they did back in the before 1910, they did the reliability runs. So you can tell if a car was a reliability run car because the hood does not open. Oh. So there's no hinge in the top of a reliability race car. Oh. Okay. So they could, they could latch the hood down, they could mark it, and you can't open it. But you, you also notice on a reliability run hood that you can open up the sides and, and, and manage to reach a few things. Okay but you can't actually open the hood to work on it. And that's what they wanted you to not to be able to do on the reliability runs. Okay. And the second thing on the reliability runs, they had special hill climbs. So this is a gravity feed fuel car. Uh -huh. Okay, we know that we have fuel in the front cowling. You know, right. next spirits. Right, <laughs> but also this tank is much higher, at least the, the bottom of this tank is much higher than the bottom of the of the tank on the cowl. Absolutely. So this would allow the car to go up a 25% grade if the car could go up a 25% grade. If there was a hill climb involved in the reliability run or the competition, you would switch this tank on and then its gravity was much better because it was much higher right. and you would fuel, you would flow your fuel into your carburetor. Also in the, on the first races, they had gas mileage tests. So in the same token, they would block the front tank and they would block that petcock and they would turn this one on and this holds exactly eight liters of fuel. I see. So then they would find out how far the car can go mm -hmm. at 40 mile an hour or whatever speed they would de designate mm -hmm. how far it could go. So this was exactly eight liters. This was an Edward Below race car and you can see the Edward Below on the sign maybe it on the other side better. A, another EB I've seen before but it's a different one. Yeah, it's not a Torbogati, it's Edward Below. Uh -huh. So this is a Below engine, a Below racing engine, okay. two liter certified, and a Below tank, and there's Below uh, insignias on the car too. Okay. So Below was like a, oh, a Carol Shelby for 1909. I see, good. Uh, Torbogati would also do that on some cars too. And then because this was a race car, you had to buy it from, a, from an agent, and the okay. last thing I'm going to show you is, is the agent was Charles Girat. You can see it over there. When you ordered this car, you had to order it from the Charles Girat agency oh. to get your race car. And you had the street address in London right there. Yep. Okay, and he was the agent, but this car was built, this is a Delage built in France, In correct? France, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. They, then this was the raciest one. Mm-hmm for 1909. So now we're going to retard our timing. Okay. Okay, our throttle is back here to idle, which is fine. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and pump the gas. The gas pedal is in the center, mm -hmm. like it was on most of the early racing cars. Okay. So now I'm pumping it. I turn my fuel on, so that you hear the fuel pump, i.e. no, because it's gravity feed. And I'm gonna go ahead and use the starter so we can hear it start over and crank. Okay. So we'll see if it starts. Okay, do you hear that? Yeah. We don't have any compression. Oh yeah, it's spinning free. Right, so there's something wrong. So this one has been four or five years since we started it. So it sounds like either the, the camshaft gear has come off, um, Something's, something's wrong. It sounds like a camshaft issue. Okay. So let's, let's look at, we'll look at the valves. So this is where the valves are. It's underneath this, this cover. 
be able to do them without a tool? It's a race car. <laughs> wow. Okay. And see if the valves are moving. Okay. Okay, shine on uh, the other side. They're not all, yeah, they're not all turning. They're not okay, all Okay, now moving. shine on the other side. Yeah, it looks like we have some stuck valves. Okay, so we have a stuck valves and it looks like we have a lazy valve or two. Um, on these old engines, they had really small and small diameter valve springs. They didn't have a lot of power. They had direct friction on the valve train. So with direct friction, no roller rockers, none of that. Right. So they didn't really have, in general, big, big strong valve springs of the 200-pound variety that we have in modern racing cars. Okay. We had valve springs on the order of 30 pounds, 40 pounds. Mm -hmm. They're pretty light. And as long as the engines were new and perfect, that was fine. The problem is with antique race cars, antique cars in general, they have low compression. Right. They have oiling system that aren't consistent. Mm -hmm. They have situations where you can have a huge amount of splash on going up hills or turning corners that you wouldn't have in a modern engine. So the, the chances for carbonizing, you know, building up carbon is a lot. You know, yeah. you need a lot of heat to take carbon away. You need lots of compression to take carbon away. And you need cons consistent running for long periods of time. Yeah. Antique cars back then and even now with club supported don't run that far at a time, not mm. that often at a time. When I put this away, it was running fine, but with the carbon that had built up and then the oil, you know, coagulating on the, on the surface, it, we have a stuck valve. Uh -huh. So what we're gonna do is, um, not for this video, but I'm gonna go ahead and take these ports out. Okay. And those are the valves. Okay. And then also under the spark plugs. So what I can do, for example, on the stuck valve, mm -hmm. I can very gingerly tap on the top of the actual valve okay. and get it unstuck. Okay. Or I could go ahead and pop it from the bottom and get it out, which is what I'm going to do. Okay. So I will take out all eight of the valves mm -hmm. and I'll clean and polish the stems. Okay. I'll put them back in and then the stuck valve situation will be gone. And the lazy valve situation, which your video showed two of them that were lazy on the return. Mm -hmm. So the lazy on return is even fast enough for the starter speed, which is 400 RPM. Right. So it's cert certainly not gonna work for 2,500. So the lazy situation, I'll polish those two and maybe they'll be fine by just polishing and cleaning. Okay. But what I might also do, uh, I might go ahead and order the next size diameter coil and get another five or 10 pounds of, of spring tension um, to not have this issue in the future. Yeah. And maybe I'm seeing why the RPM is limited to 2200 RPM. Maybe I get another four or 500 RPM with it all running right. Yeah. So we'll do another video with me cleaning the valves or with putting it back in and actually starting it for real. Yeah. So what I just found out is we're not getting a ride in the Delage today. That's the point. So I'll hit it again where you see the stuck one not move at all. Okay. And I want you to actually show the lazy ones too. Okay. Ready? Yep. Yeah. It's just slowly drifting down. Yeah. And it can't be that way. Right. Okay. Yeah. It's not holding compression when it's doing that. People can really see what a stuck valve means and what a lazy valve is. Yeah. That's because good. you got lazy valve, you got two or three of those. And you got a stuck valve, you got... So that's, that's a very cool um, antique racing tire. So wait a minute, this is an actual... Yeah. It's that old? This is like a... No. Correct? It, the casting is. Okay. The casting is. But it's... This is the actual casting from 120 years ago. Okay. The, the casing is, was molded in the same casing mold. But they only make a few of these a year. So there's none on the, on the car. But that's what those were called, those were Dunlop cords, and that's up there in that picture from 1902 where you had the Dunlops. Right, so the Dunlop company still keeps the casing. Right, so okay. that, this is the 1902 or three. Right, and that was a pit stop or a... Right, for the Gordon Bennett race in 1902 or three. Okay. So that's, 
and they that's an original casing, which is pretty cool. That is cool. Wow. Okay. Okay, guys. The long and the short of it is, the Delage is not ready to drive today. I will be back soon. I think uh, Ellen is all over this whole problem, and uh, we'll be back quickly with a follow-up video and uh, see this uh, car going and get a ride and give you a report on all that. I look forward to it. Thanks for joining up with us. It's great to have you on the channel. Stay tuned.